About three months ago I was driving home from Worcester, Massachusetts. On my way home I saw one of the most fucked up and bizarre things I have ever witnessed. It was probably around 2 a.m. when it happened. I was in the city with a couple of my friends and my girlfriend. We were at the hookah bar, catching up and having a few drinks. The bar closes pretty late and we didn't get out of there till well after midnight. After dropping my friends off at home I brought my girlfriend to her house so she could grab her car. The plan was for her to follow me to my house and she was going to spend the night. She had work in the morning and needed her car so she could leave directly from my house and not have to force me into driving her. I was all for this because. To be frank, I'm usually very lonely at night and I enjoy the company of my beautiful girlfriend. It's not too often I can convince her to sleep over. It's a very nice night, a little on the cold side for July, but crystal clear skies and a perfect thumbnail moon hanging overhead. I live in the back country of Massachusetts. It's basically all woods, farms, and bumpy, pothole littered roads. Driving these roads at night can be a little unnerving but I've become used to it and generally enjoy a late night drive through the country. Pick very related. The drive from my girlfriend's house to my house takes about 15 minutes. Somehow she manages to get in front of my car with hers. It's not a big deal, she knows how to get to my house. After all we've been together for over a year now, so I think nothing of it. I reached into my shirt pocket, take out my pack of Marlboros and light a cigarette. Shifting into third gear, I accelerate onto a very pretty stretch of road with farm fields on both sides. Paying no attention to the road, I know the route to my house like the back of my hand, I look down to ash my cigarette in the ashtray, and upon looking up there is a deer in the middle of the road. It's a miracle that neither my girlfriend nor I hit it. Deer, fox, raccoons, and other critters are common to these back roads of New England. With my heart racing, I let out a laugh imaging the damage my crummy 94 Ford Escort would sustain if I hit something like that. After driving down the very scenic farm-laden road, our two-car caravan begins the final leg of the drive to my house. This street, Whitewood Road, is very steep and incredibly windy. A few times I've almost flipped my car because I was careless with my driving. Being on the edge of my seat after almost hitting that deer, I made sure to pay attention. The tail lights of my girlfriend's car ahead of me acted like a marker to follow. I watched them vanish for a second as her car went around a sharp corner. And then to reappear after I had taken the same corner. The road crept through the woods like a snake. At the last bend before the bridge which brings you into a neighborhood, a very secluded one on the outskirts of town, my girlfriend's brake lights went on. She's a really shitty driver so I didn't think anything of it. As she took the turn her high beams illuminated a white shape on the outside corner of the road. Just outside the tree line where the white breakdown lane line would be if this road had traffic lines. I drove forward, probably at about 10 miles per hour because the turn was sharp and because I wanted to see what this white shape was. I wish I hadn't. It was a man. He was laying the in the fetal position. He was covered in dirt. Scraped from head to toe wearing nothing but a pair of white cut-off shorts. No shoes and no shirt. His hair was long, thin and jet black. He body was snow white in color. His skin glowed in the yellow hue of my headlights. I stopped my car next to him. My first impression was that it was a hitchhiker who was hit by a car or maybe someone had beaten him up and thrown him out their vehicle, stranding him alone. I was an Eagle Scout and know a thing or two about first aid. I figured I could help him, let him use my phone, or even give him a ride. I leaned over into the passenger seat and rolled down the window. The passenger side door was maybe 5 feet away from the man. Unlocked. As I rolled down the window the man looked up at me. His eyes were as black as night. The pupils were as big as Arias. He didn't blink. He couldn't. He didn't have eyelids. I looked directly into this man's face. He looked crazy, and animalistic. Like the wilderness had turned him into some kind of beast. 
After about 10 seconds the man began to rise to his feet, putting his hand onto his knobby knees for support. His frail chest rising and falling rapidly. He looked me right in the face the whole time, and when he finally got on his feet he made a move for my door handle. I was frozen with fear and didn't know what to do at first. Once I got my senses I floored it but the car wouldn't move. I had left it in third gear and my car being an absolute shitbox just whined and sputtered and crept forward at about 3 miles per hour. I slipped it back into first gear and took off, all the while keeping my side fixated on this man. As I drove away his sunken, crazy face turned into a grin. I took out my phone and called my girlfriend. Surely she saw this guy, there's no way I'm imaging this. My girlfriend answered the phone immediately. I told her to pull over and wait for me. She was about a 1000 feet up the road. I pulled up next to her, my window already about halfway down and asked her if she saw that guy. She literally began screaming and crying and sped off. She called me and apologized for driving away like that. She said she was too freaked out to sit around in the car that close to the man. I told her to go to our friend's house. He lived in the neighborhood, about 10 seconds away from where we were pulled over. She agreed and led the way. We got to his house, locked our doors, met up with each other and held hands. Her hand in mine, we ran into his basement. It's always unlocked. Friends just drop by at his house, it's how it's always been. He was sitting at his computer playing WoW. We told him what happened and he said we have to go back and check this out, that there must be an explanation. So all three of us piled into my car. And began talking about what we saw. My friend wasn't convinced. He's a see it to believe it kind of guy. We drove down the road where we saw the man. Nothing. We turned around and drove down it again. Nothing. We made a detour, emerging on a side road that leads to the road where we saw this man. We all agreed to make one more pass down the road before calling it a night. Not expecting to see anything. I lit up another cigarette. As I was pulling my lighter from my pocket I saw him. He was standing against a tree. No he was standing facing the tree. His arms were crossed in front of his chest. He wasn't hiding. He wasn't moving. He was just there. My girlfriend began screaming at the top of her lungs. I couldn't take it. It was too much. I gunned it. Speeding off down the road, these horrible screams just echoing in my ear. I turned around and told her to shut the fuck up. The screams turned to sobs and sporadic sniffles. My friend, in the front passenger seat was awestruck. He couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I was so anxious and nervous. I didn't know what to think. That's when she said it. He had a hammer in his hand. I didn't understand what she was saying through the sobs. She repeated it. He had a hammer in his hand. I decided to call the police. I pulled over further up the road and entered 9-1-1 into my phone. It was ringing. What the fuck am I going to say degree I thought. The dispatcher picked up. I told him the story through a shaky and cracking voice. The dispatch told me to stay put. That they were going to send a patrol car, and that they wanted us to show him where we saw this man. We obeyed and waited for what seemed like an eternity. Every sound seemed like him. Every movement seemed like it was him. We didn't speak. I just sat there, chain smoking. Just as I lit a cigarette the officer showed up. I flicked the butt onto the ground and proceeded to show him where we saw this guy. There was nothing to found. After waiting around with the cop for a while, answering his repetitive questions, we left. We decided to go to McDonald's for breakfast. It was around 4.30 am now. We made our trip back down Whitewood RD. We passed the spot where we were pulled over the spot where I called the cops from. That's when I noticed something. My high beams caught the reflection of an object on the ground. It was a hammer. 
I stopped the car to look. It was most certainly a hammer, and not three feet away from it was my barely smoked cigarette. I don't drive down this road anymore. I can't bear the thought of what might have happened if we sat pulled over on the side of the road for any longer. The police said they would continue their investigation but I don't think they'll do shit. Somewhere in the woods of Whitewood Road there's a man that has no reason being there, and to be honest I never want to know what he was doing. The whole story is true. You can believe me if you want, you can say this is just made up, say I'm trolling, whatever. I don't care. But I promise. The image of that man, him as I've come to refer to him. Grinning at me will be burned into my mind for the rest of my life. Things in my life have been pretty crazy in my life recently, slash x slash, and I thought I might share since I've heard stories from here. I don't really expect anyone here to believe me, and that's fine. This is intended to be mainly therapeutic to me. I want to tell at least someone what's happening to me. I lived near an old patch of woods in North America when I was about 12. When I say old, I mean primordial old. Shit lives in there that you never knew existed. I lived in a little town, at the end of a dead end lane, before people started moving in and making changes to the town. I had three friends that I always hung out with over vacations and during the summer, we didn't all go to the same school, but we lived in the same town. Taylor, Josh, Pepper, and me. The woods were kind of ours, nobody went, or goes, into the woods. There are no roads that went through them, and it was just better to avoid them unless you were really young, stupid, or high. Sometimes, a neighboring farmer's animal would get lost in the woods, and though attempts would be made to find it, rarely any animals were ever found. If they were, they usually died of shock shortly thereafter. I can detail the sorts of things we found in the woods, but that might be for later. The shit we found was pretty awesome. But in the summer of 98, something happened that I can't really remember. Pep, Taylor, Josh, and I went into the woods, and apparently were kidnapped. We spent nearly 48 hours in there, but I can hardly remember anything. Here's what I can remember. At around 5 o'clock in the evening in August, we all met at the end of the lane where we usually did before we headed off to play. Because it was before the time of reliable contact with parents, my mom gave me her watch and told me to remember to be back in by 7. We were all a little nervous, because people were saying a prowler was living in the woods, and they'd seen him around town, and we were pretty certain we'd seen him, too, though I don't remember actually seeing him. I remember running into the woods behind Pep and Taylor. Josh was fastest, and he was already over the fence and into the woods. We must have gone to the fort we found, it was probably the remnants of an old house, but it was pretty unrecognizable to us. I remember hearing something crashing in the woods, and Josh asking if we heard it, too. I remember telling Pepper she should stay put, and we would go check it out. After that, I don't remember anything. After 48 hours, and our parents and people in the town launching a search for us, they found me in a place they'd already looked. I was backed up into a large oak tree, standing alone in a clearing in the woods. I wasn't wearing shoes, and there were long, bloody gashes on my back and legs. They never found Pep, Josh, or Taylor. A hunter found one of Pep's barrettes some years later buried under pine needles. He said he'd only seen it because he'd been up in his stand, and he had seen a glint below him. Some college kids found an old cache of our stuff that we must have left in a kind of burrow. It really troubles me that I can't remember more of what happened, and the stuff that I do remember the therapists told me are probably false memories. I want to share some of these with you, if anyone is interested. Tell me more up. I am very interested in hearing. Alrighty. I remember the Willow Man. He was tall, thin, and had a laugh like thunder. I remember seeing him in the trees, moving so fast we could hardly see him. The day we disappeared, we didn't see him at all, but other days we would see him mostly in the summer. I always wondered why. 
maybe because he was harder to spot in the foliage. You could always tell he was there, though, because he moved differently from the rest of the trees. We tried telling our parents about him. Mine were alarmed at the thought of a strange person in the woods, Pep's parents, who were very Christian, thought he was either a, a devil or be someone trying to scare us. Josh didn't bother telling his folks, he liked to pretend he was more adult than the rest of us, and Taylor only had a mom who was usually out working one of her three jobs. Some people believed about the Willow Man, though. Some people even knew he was there. If we saw him, we didn't stick around, though. He never seemed to do anything except stand, watching you, about 30 or so feet away, swaying like a tree. To be honest, that summer we were a little obsessed with the Willow Man. We always knew he was there, but I remember Josh making it his life's mission to find the Willow Man that summer. The rest of us regarded the Willow Man the way you would usually think about a monster in your closet. You were pretty sure he was there, but you didn't have any real proof, except that you were scared as hell. So the summer began with us looking for places the Willow Man would be. This turned out to be pretty stupid. We automatically assumed he would be in dangerous, hard to access, or creepy places. In the woods, there were frequently old, abandoned buildings. Another town used to be next to ours about 200 years ago, and had been since subsumed by the woods. What happened to the people in the next town, and why didn't it exist anymore? They probably all moved out into other surrounding towns, but we like to think that the Willow Man had gotten them. You could still find old cobblestone paths peppered throughout the woods, and if you followed them, you could trace the outlines of the old towns. We decided that the town's graveyard and what we decided was a cheese factory were the most likely places for the Willow Man to be. I think we quickly decided the graveyard was a wash. I remember going there one evening, and finding a few graves in the dozen or so that were there were empty. While unsettling and creepy, Taylor, Pep, and I didn't take it to be obvious evidence of the Willow Man's movements, but Josh thought otherwise. He was sure it was the Willow Man's work. He had either dug their bodies back up, or these were graves where the people were dead, but no one ever found their bodies. I remember spending a few weeks of sleepless nights, waking up and looking into the woods after that, to make sure the Willow Man hadn't followed me home. The cheese factory was a little different. I can't remember what happened there very well, either, but I remember running, and falling out of the woods with Pep and Taylor. I remember we thought we had lost Josh in the factory, but he showed up cranky and pissed that we had left him when we had stopped to hop across the town's old cistern. I don't remember any of this happening, but I know whoever we had seen in the cheese factory hadn't been Josh. Is there anyone listening? I feel so empty talking to silence. The old town was generally where we spent the first few weeks looking for the Willow Man. There honestly wasn't that much to explore, since it was all run down and before the advent of electricity. There was also a sort of watchtower made of wood somewhere in the center of the woods. While you might think that we were trespassing, this thing was as old as dirt, hewn from whole trees by probably axes, and held together by old, rusty metal nails. It was the most curious construction. Josh decided around the end of May that it was originally built by the old townsfolk to keep a lookout for the Willow Man, and decided in keeping of our forefathers traditions, we should use it to do the same. We planned to have a sleepover in it, in fact. I remember lying straight faced to my parents about sleeping over at Josh's. We all did, in fact, except Josh. We all snuck into the woods at around 5, and climbed up the watchtower. It was close enough to the village that I could see the town fire hall, right at the edge of the woods. The watchtower wasn't that tall, maybe 15 feet or so, and it had a great ladder that we discovered could be pulled up through a lever system. We didn't manage to spend the whole night. At around 8, we started hearing this aggravated breathing and crashing through the undergrowth, and then this long moaning. It could have just been someone who was high or drunk, but we spent about another hour sweating out the noises before we got too scared and booked it out of the woods. 
It didn't seem like anything pursued us, but when we went back to the tower the next day, the crackers, fruit snacks, and soda we had brought had been torn through and strewn around the clearing. That part right there scared me more than anything else in the whole ordeal. Sorry guys, something weird is going on when I try to post. Every fucking time, something happens, so it takes me a few minutes. I think it might be worth telling you that the woods don't belong to anyone. I think it's a state park now, or something, or a preserve, or something like that. In any case, no one can use it for foresting, except for growth management every once in like 5 years or something. As a side note, after the kidnapping, my family moved away from the town for about a decade. We didn't sell the house or anything, we lived with my mom's parents in the next town over for a while, before moving out to Seattle for a few years. When I was about 18, we moved back into our old home. I didn't, and still don't remember what happened, so going back home didn't feel that traumatic for me. I felt like Pep, Josh, and Taylor are were still here. I still do feel that way, to a certain extent. I just don't know where they are, or what happened to them. Your feeling of them still being there is probably due to you not being there to let it sink in that they're gone, and the sudden return of all the old feelings of the town brought that one too. Does anyone have any idea what this thing might be? Anyone heard similar stories or know of any myths? I'm interested now. You're probably right, it still doesn't feel real. I keep expecting them to just show up. In any case, after the watchtower, we found something like a burrow farther into the woods. There were three rocks, two propped up, and one on top, leading down to a hole in the ground. At first we were distracted, thinking it was an animal's den or something, but after shining flashlights, tossing in noisemakers, and finally crawling in, we discovered it was actually a deserted cave. There was a rank, rotten smell there, more human than animal. It's weird that I remember it to this day, or maybe I only remember remembering. There were things around the burrow that made you almost think a person lived there. There was a little hole where water dripped down from the ceiling, and made a kind of water dish. In the corner, there were old magazines and the ends of gnawed bones. We were puzzled as to what to think of it. We figured it was probably some hobos, or a college kids. But then Josh decided this was where the willow man took the people he stole, and kept them here, before they disappeared forever. Taylor chipped in, figured he ate them, but we all knew that wasn't true. The willow man didn't eat people, that was just stupid. It took a few days to sufficiently stake out the burrow. In fact, it took about two weeks before we moved on from it, figuring it to be a bust. Nothing ever happened while we were there, so we figured it was safe enough to use for ourselves, and we decided to keep different willow man hunting odds and ends there. At one point, we ended up stashing a whole Coleman tent in there, but it ended up getting shredded to hell in the end of July, which was when we decided to stop using the burrow. Besides, we were pretty sure someone else was trying to use it, too. When we would visit the burrow, sometimes our stuff would have been gone through, or sometimes missing. Occasionally there would be drag marks outside the opening of the cave, which creeped us out more than anything. I'm going to step out for a while guys I've got some things to do, and I have to go to work soonish, but I'll be back. A lot of the other shit is pretty surreal, and probably didn't happen. For example, I remember seeing the willow man outside of my house where the woods meets my lawn, clinging to the tree closest to my house and staring into my room. He would reach up and scrape the window to my room with his fingers and whisper come play. And I would scream and scream, and no one would come for me. Another time, I remember playing in the tree house in my yard next to the woods with Pep. We were playing a card game, I think Uno, when we heard the snuffling against the side of the treehouse, like a dog had gotten up there. We both froze, and it continued until it reached the entrance of the treehouse, when we heard something digging into the wood, like an animal scrabbling to get in. We both started screaming in terror, and eventually my dad showed up, 
but he acted like nothing was wrong. He just popped his head up into the treehouse and asked if we wanted sandwiches for lunch. I think I mentioned before how keyed we were before we disappeared in August. It was kind of like that through the whole summer. Josh become increasingly more irritable and moody, and Taylor would space out, and not hear things right away. Pep became kind of skittish, and hung around me for comfort. At first, you might think this was just normal prepubescent stuff, but the change was so sudden and radical, that it stood out like a sore thumb. Pep's mom was even threatening to send her to a psychiatrist. We all started suffering from sleepless nights, and when we could sleep, we all had nightmares. I got to the point when I wasn't with my friends that I would just lay listlessly around the house. And I remember hearing this one song around then. Just this one little snippet, and it keeps playing on repeat in my head, like a little bit of carnival music. I almost think I hear it when we were out in the woods somewhere. Like I mentioned, I can't remember the day I disappeared entirely clearly, but I do remember snippets. One of the most disturbing things I remember is kneeling on my knees on a wide piece of stone bedrock I think, with my hands up in front of me, holding something. I don't remember what this was. I also remember being gagged, I think, or something being forced into my mouth. But the first thing after I do remember after these little splintery memories is waking up in a hospital room. It took me ages to be convinced that Pep, Josh, and Taylor were missing. After a while, people started saying they were dead, but I knew better. When we moved out, I still knew better. And I know better to this day. Which takes us to the present day. I am 25. I have my own place in town, but I frequently crash with my parents because I'm a giant pussy. As I type, I am in my old room in my parents' house, in fact. And I think the Willow Man is back. At some point, I'll come back and tell you all the other weird little things we found in the wood when I was younger, but I want to get what's happening to me now off my chest. It started a few months back, right before winter started. I was taking the four-wheeler out just for something to do, I have only a part-time job, so I have some free time, and just as I was about to start it when I saw something glinting just past the start of the woods. The woods, by now, have become something that is only vaguely frightening, like hearing something in an urban legend. But when I saw that little glinting like winking in the woods, I began to have a small panic attack. I couldn't identify why I was so scared, but I knew if I went and looked, I was going to find something I didn't want to. And yet, against my better judgment, I left the four-wheeler and went to the woods, and though it had been only about 100 feet from where I was standing, it seemed to take forever to get to where the woods began. It had been a pretty fresh, breezy day then, but the woods were still and calm, with almost no wind moving through. But then, the woods are always like that, and you can't judge what the weather is like when you're in them. They look so much different from when I played in them when I was a kid. There's lots more undergrowth now behind my property, and it just seemed quieter. No birds, no squirrels, nothing. Just the sound of the wind. And where had the thing been that I'd seen flashing at me in the underbrush? I was torn between going farther in to investigate, and standing just where the woods began, because I was terrified. But before I could decide to to either, the trees had moved a bit in the wind and the thing blazed up at me like a tiny beacon. It had startled me so much that I jumped back before I could see what it had been. I had stood frozen where I was before I bent down to check it out. It was just uncovered under a little pile of dead foliage and mallow. It was an X-Men trading card that kept catching the sun and reflecting back at me, the holographic kind that were popular back in the 90s. This one had Wolverine on it, thrusting his claws out at you. It had been Josh's. I tried rationalizing to myself, because the last place it had been was my tree house, and then in the watchtower in the woods, but I figured it could have just basically migrated like basically everything in the woods does. But it had been so shiny and untouched by the elements I knew this wasn't true. In the end, I couldn't pick it up. I felt like it was a trap, 
so I turned around and went back inside, leaving the four-wheeler out and getting a lecture from my dad later. When I checked back in the evening later that day to see if the card was still there, it had disappeared. I know I didn't imagine it, and it felt like a trap. It's in northern New York, but that's all I'm going to say. I've been finding different things on the edge of the woods since then, but I haven't gotten the balls to go in and check it out. When there was still no snow cover, I found an empty bottle of lemonade, the label was sun bleached and faded, and something I remember from being a kid, a compass, something of Josh's that he had been exceedingly proud of, and we'd used to try to triangulate where the willow man would be, unsuccessfully, and a metal ball with tiny little dents in the surface like an animal had been chewing on it. The last one I have no idea what to make of, but it seems familiar to me somehow. I have no idea how these things keep coming back to me, but it's been frightening me, to say the least. I've been trying to ignore the edge of the woods lately, because the snow cover is gone again, but I'm afraid there's something there, waiting for me. Back again, everyone. Sorry I came back and left so suddenly last night, some weird shit happened to me. I was headed out my door for work, and I had my phone ready and aimed at the woods to take some pictures when I saw something flash past the viewfinder really fast. So my heart was in my mouth it had appeared to be bipedal and human height or taller and woods colored, brown, but I told myself it was a deer. So I turned and walked down my driveway, and started down the street. Happily, the street leads me away from the woods, so when I walked through town to get to my job, I managed to shake off a good portion of my fear. When I finally got to the library, and was rounding the side of the building to use the back door, I stopped. The library is attached to the fire hall which, if you recall, is pressed flush to the woods. I remember looking into the woods, and seeing something. And the next thing I remember is kneeling on my knees, facing my own backyard at 5 o'clock in the evening. Once again, I didn't have any shoes. My feet were bare and my wrists had pieces of twine tied around them. I didn't have my phone, my personal effects, nothing. So I just kind of wandered into the house, which was warm but empty. I sat down at the kitchen table for I don't know how long before I started to crave some sort of human interaction and came on here just to know I wasn't the only person in the universe. Then I went to bed. My mom woke me up about 10ish asking me if I was okay, and that the library had been calling asking where I was because I didn't show up for work. I might have alarmed her a little bit, because we ended up going to the hospital again. I haven't been feeling really well since then. Everything hurts, and somehow I've got all these bruises on me. I am gonna shit some bricks if Op doesn't get photos. Also the more you talk the more it sounds fake, there's no way there's less than 50 people in your village. I will, keep your shirt on. Here's how where I live works the township I live in incorporates about 3 or 4 villages Altogether. So although I live in a town with around 1000 people, I actually live in a tiny little hamlet with a cluster of houses. That's just how NNY works, folks. Guys, sorry I left and didn't return until now. I keep getting fucked with lately. I left work yesterday, and got waylaid by Josh's mom. I spent the entire day with her yesterday, and she doesn't have a computer. She was freaking out, for some reason, about wondering where Josh was, and if I'd seen him lately. It's been a long while, and she never started showing signs of crazy. I was hoping this was just some sort of minor break because of stress. To make her feel better, I spent the day and part of the night with her, too. About 3 in the morning, I woke up, I was sleeping in the living room, to hear taps on the patio door. Josh's family have this giant German Shepherd, and it's smart enough to claw at the door when it can see someone and wants in. So, half awake, I went to the door, only to find nothing on the other side of the glass. I kind of stood there stupidly for a while, staring into their backyard, before I saw something glinting in the yard. And then I realized something was staring back at me, or thought there was. There were these two little red lights, winking on and off in the mid-horizon. 
I tried figuring out if they were possibly cell towers, but then they moved off, to their side yard, and I tried convincing myself it was some sort of animal. I huddled back onto the couch, the dog had jumped up, so it had been inside the whole time, and tried getting back to sleep. I didn't mention what I saw to Josh's mom. The next morning, when I left, I saw there was a cow tooth, sitting on the porch railing. It had been another of Josh's keepsakes, something he'd picked up on a trip to a farm in school. So, I had woken up at about 5 or 5.30 this morning, and made my way home. I didn't bother with the cow tooth. It was still dark, so it was damned unnerving walking back to my house, but I made my way back unmolested, made my way quietly into the house and threw my ass into bed to try to get a little more sleep. And then, not too long ago, I was woken by this awful shrieking coming from somewhere behind my house. I woke up, sprinted to my parents' room where the best view of the backyard it, parents were already at work, and stared into the dark again. I didn't know whether or not to pass it off as animals, because I did hear something brush against the house, and then some low, gnawing growling, but then nothing. It's just started getting a little lighter, so I think I may check outside and see if there's any carnage. To answer some things that were brought up, yeah, there was something up with Josh, he was kind of the leader of the merry band, and he was one of those kids that would grow up into one of those guys that naturally take charge of things. Also, yes, I am trying to protect my safety as well as yours. I've given you all the hints I feel comfortable giving you, but I will stress again, I live in upstate New York, on the lake. It's about five minutes walk from my house. I'm sorry if my story has holes in it. Though I really appreciate everyone coming to read and enjoy it, I didn't come here to make you believe it. I can only tell you what's been going on in my life and what's happened. I'm not going to remember everything clearly, partly because I'm human, and partly because my brain has been fucked with. Sorry guys, you were correct in thinking I had work. My family owns a farm that I work on when I'm not in regular work that pays me. In any case, I forgot entirely to share what else has been happening to me aside for my random blackouts, and visit to Josh's mother's house. Recently, I'll hear this one strain of music. I think I may have mentioned this before it's like a little bit of carnival music, and then a little melody of bells. Our town has two churches, and one of them is still in use, and plays melodies every half hour. I recognize what that sounds like, but I'll only hear these different songs when I'm closer to the woods. In retrospect, I seem to remember these from when I was a child, too. It's an unsettling sensation, as if something is trying to lure me into the woods. I had a scare around last April I forgot to mention as well. Remember how I told you I had been found barefoot? I discovered one of my old shoes, tied by one of the laces, and dangling from a lower branch as though someone had put it there for someone to claim. I recognized it, though. I had been wearing converses that I had been extremely proud of, with a star emblazoned on the heel. I had been heading out from my parents' house to go back to my place, when I had seen it, and had approached to get a better look. The shoe was dangling about eye level to me, and everything about it screamed trap. I stood about 10 feet from it, examining it. It was battered and damaged from the elements, but I could still make out where blood had soaked into them. That was when I heard this enormous crashing slightly farther off in the woods, in a rather leisurely pace. Could it have been deer? Certainly. But I noped the fuck out of there anyway. My mind might have been playing tricks on me, but I swear that I could hear a booming coming back at me from the woods. Sorry guys, I've been kind of busy today to try to keep my mind off of it. I was working on our family's farm when I heard what sounded like Josh calling me in the woods. I didn't go but I just kept staring and there was that thing again. Next time I will take a tape recorder or a video camera so I can show you all. I have to get back to work for now but I will update later. So, first let me describe how I've spent the last three summers. Live in Ohio. B. 
be camp counselor at Inawoods Camp in Hocking Hills region of southern Ohio. Clear Creek Valley is one of the most biodiverse areas in the entire world. Not kidding. More than some rainforests. Nearest civilization is town of Rockbridge, tiny, many miles away. Everyone lives in cabins with no air conditioning, power, or lights. I'm assigned to the older boys, because I'm better with the bushcraft. Teach them battening, fire building, debris huts, edible plants, the works. One night every week, we camp out, use the skills, and sleep under the stars. Every week, each cabin has to do a camp improvement project, chores. Little kids pull weeds on what few, unpaved, barely maintained, paths we have. Big kids, 14 to 17, use saws, rakes, and shovels to clear out new campsites, or refurbish old ones. There's always been a rivalry between the older boys and girls, espikely among the counselors. That's the camp. It's a nice place. I'm there for six weeks every summer, but the kids only stay for one week sessions. After three years of romping through the forests there, I know the place like the back of my hand. There's still some places I haven't been, but they are few and far between. As a side note, every counselor has a camp name so campers can't find us on Facebook and stuff. I'm Hawkeye. My friends in the story are Turkey, certified EMT and my co-counselor. Magenta, old friend slash engineering student. Khaleesi, Vizina student. Magenta and Khaleesi are counselors for the older girls, Turkey and I are counselors for the older boys. Be last week of camp. Everyone happy to be going home. What camp improvement projects don't get done have to be done by counselors after camp is done, but before they can leave. Fuck that. Turkey, Magenta, Khaleesi and I all agree to have our kids do all of the hard chores so we don't have to do them alone. We clean up a campsite on the side of a hill called Black Feather. The girls clean up a site called Human Nature. They're bragging because it hasn't been used in around 20 years, camp is 90 plus years old, and we will finally get it up and going again. I'm a bit jealous because I've never been to that site. The only clue as to where it is is a dotted line on a 30-year-old hand-drawn map indicating a shitty trail. Magenta says she knows where it is. I think she's bluffing, but she's a smart girl, I figure if anyone could find it, it'd be her. Next day. Head to Black Feather. Find box tortoise and explain tortoise versus turtle. A tree has fallen right in the campsite. Go go gadget saw. Fifteen teenage boys attack the fallen tree, one foot diameter, with hacksaws. That bitch didn't know what hit it. Show them how to split wood. Black Feather will have firewood for many years. Return to camp. Now it's time to select overnight spots. Magenta has a smug grin on her face, looks me in the eye, and says we're going to human nature. What do you think about that? Never been there. Where is it? It's in the valley, a new part of the forest. We found where the fire ring was, but all the rocks were strewn about. That's weird. Nah. Walks away. Turkey comes up to me and says that he let a younger cabin take black feather, as it's not too far a hike for them. Where are we staying? Tatanka. I was very excited because there is a very cool clearing right by Tatanka, perfect for astronomy. It's right on top of a hill, so it's a tough hike, but that makes the food taste so much better. Next day, overnight day. 15 boys plus 2 coup. We made hamburgers on a grate that we carried up. 7 pounds of meat to divide. We ate like kings. Campfire jacks for desert. Basically tinfoil wrapped tortilla with chocolate and marshmallow inside. Uh oh person who packed the food gave us no tortillas. I'm fine with going without, but some of the guys were looking forward to them. Don't worry guys, I'll just pop over to another campsite and see if they have extras. Quietly to Turkey. Where are the other campsites? 
I have heard the girls from downhill all evening, but I don't know where they are. I don't know man, his first year counseling, but Magenta said human nature was in the valley. Did you see that raggedy ass trail leading downhill when we were headed up? Like 20 m past the last cabin. I did see it, but it didn't look like it had been used recently. You sure that's right? Yeah man, that's where the trail is on the map. It is around the right area, but the map even has written on it not to scale. Some sites may be overgrown. All right man, that's about right. I go down towards the trail. Dash 9.30 p.m. so it's dark. I've got a whistle, my Mora companion, blade bathed in white ash, so it works on demons, and headlamp. Get to trailhead. It's a bit dark, but not so much that it's oppressive. I head into the trail. About 5 m in, it suddenly turns from undergrowth to grass underfoot. This is odd. All the undergrowth is getting thinner too, but the path is still very defined for something 20 years old. Suddenly no undergrowth. Just trees. Eerie almost brightness. Don't even need my headlamp. It's a new moon, so this is fucking weird. The section of forest I'm in looks very new, thin trees, low ground cover, no bushes or mid-level plants. The feeling I get in it though. It feels old. Like, walking inside a tomb old. I keep walking, more to distract myself from how weird this section of forest is. I realize that I don't hear the girls anymore. They're normally very loud, being teenage girls. I stop. Everything in the world stops around me. Not even insects are chirping. I see fog slowly filling into the valley. It's now bright in there, despite being a new moon. This place is not good. I'm actually getting goosebumps describing it. A stream runs down the center of the valley. Shallow, but still a stream. I don't know why, because every fiber of my being said otherwise, but I continued on the path, crossing the stream. Once I crossed, a wave of the most powerful feeling hit me, one I can't even articulate to people. The best way I can describe it is like feeling with every oz of your body that something is the most despicable evil that has ever existed. This place was bigger than me, bigger than the forest. I should not be there. I was more scared than anything. Since there was nothing to fight, I ran. Further down the path. I don't know why the fuck I did it. Every step carried me further into it, but I couldn't stop. It felt like I had run at least a mile or two, but it was probably no more than a few hundred meters. I am not afraid of admitting that I was almost in tears at this point. It's so much easier when there's something to focus your fear on. But when there's nothing, it just takes over. Suddenly. Offside of increasingly dispersing path. Glow of campfire. Sound of girls talking in low voices. Stumble towards campsite. Magenta's voice, much shakier than normal. H hello. Who's there? I try to be as calm as possible, to avoid spooking the campers, although I realize that they are already unsettled as it is. H. Hey Magenta. It's Hawkeye. I'm coming out of the bush. Oh good W what do you need? I totally forgotten what I was there for. Just popping by. Cool. She says then gestures me to come over to her, away from the campers. Hawkeye what the fuck are you doing? Was that you? Where did you come from? Why are you here? I was getting something, wait, was what me? What do you mean where did I come from, you took that path, right? She looked me in the eye and for a second, I see the same look that must have been on my face minutes earlier, when I realized what I was feeling. She shook her head just slightly, and I could feel the color drain from my face. This was a bad idea Hawkeye. What are you going to do? She told me how it felt much safer at the campsite, with the fire going. She certainly wasn't going to lead them out through the forest in the dark. Khaleesi was also new, and didn't know how to get anywhere 
so it was up to Magenta. She said she'd stay up all night and tend the fire. Keep the flames hot and large. I looked her in the eye and asked her if she'd be okay. She said yes, but didn't sound convinced. I remembered why I was there, and grabbed some extra tortillas, because damn it, I'm not going to go home empty-handed. Magenta shows me the path they took. Old, but completely different from my ingress route. I make it back on the other path. I feel it as I leave the campsite, but it fades as I walk away. Make it to a big, well-maintained path. Holy crap, this is the same one the other path let out on. Walk back towards camp. Pass where it should have been. What? It's not there. It's like the path closed up. Some of the thickest forest I've ever encountered where that damn path should have been. I know that's where it was because there was large boulder opposite of it. Anyways. Make it back to Tatanka where my boys have been waiting for me. Turkey yells to me as I walk up. Hey Hawkeye. Where have you been? Did you walk all the way back to the kitchen? Ha ha ha. I realize it's like an hour and a half later. Uh, yeah. The girls didn't have any. Come up, let the older boys take over teaching the younger ones how to make campfire jacks. Pull turkey aside. The girls had tortillas. What? Don't ever go to human nature. There's something else, in that forest. What do you mean? I have him look me in the eye. He sees that I'm not joking. Turkey. It is not a good area of forest. Never go there. Okay man, I won't. We go to bed, but I can't sleep in my hammock. I kept having dreams about the forest. The next day. Wake up. Have campers rekindle fire, since it burned down. Pancakes on griddle we hauled up. Clean upside. Pack. Head back to camp. Get equipment put away, send campers with turkey to get showers and stuff. Magenta pulls me aside outside the dining hall, but away from campers. She has bags under her eyes, obviously from lack of sleep. Hawkeye, did you sleep last night? Not well, I kept having dreams. About the forest. Why yet? Hawkeye, if I tell you something, do you promise you'll believe me? You felt it, you know what it was like. Sure Magenta, go ahead. Every girl either talked in their sleep last night, or woke up crying at some point in the night. We didn't eat breakfast, we just got out of there. Every girl. Every damn girl. I swear to you. I heard them, I didn't sleep a second. I was tending the fire. I don't know what would have happened if it would have gone out. Okay Magenta, it's okay. I believe you. That's about it. Go home four days later. I don't know what the hell. Was. But that's it. Sorry for the long post time, I'll compile it into one big image and post it next time. Dude, I know that feeling. Went through an old brick works near my house. Rumor has it that some kid got stabbed in the tunnels and as soon as you step into it you have that feeling of instant dread. You feel as if your body is being gently squeezed b. Oh. On the master map, which is a hand painted, contour lines and everything, map on a wooden board, which all the other maps are based upon, there is a red smudge between the path to human nature and the last cabin, right where my path would be. I should you not. I think someone had a double meaning when they named the campsite human nature. Whenever I think of human nature as a concept, I think of conflict, war, hatred, and violence. The first person to found the campsite gets to name it, but nobody I've asked knows who founded human nature. It's just always. Been there. I'll never go back. Camp is a wonderful place that has a special meaning to me, but human nature is something else entirely. Exactly. Trying to articulate it to someone who hasn't felt it is impossible. You need to feel te fear inherent to the place. It's everywhere. I can't ever go back. 
Magenta won't even talk about it. She yells at me whenever I bring it up. We've been close friends for years, but she won't talk about this. My fucking face when this fucking thread. I'm a sheriff in Oregon near Malha Lake. We've had two reports of man hunting. The first time I was two miles away from Ruby Ridge, there was reports of flares, gunfire, and yelling, me thinking it's a redneck shoot, I go in with M16A1, fuck your Vietnam patrol rifle, 210 rounds 223, cold 1911 with 60 rounds, after the gulf I'm anal about possible combat situations, can't in next post. It started as a rumor around here seven years ago when I was a junior in high school. ASR told us that the woods we often go in has seen a large number of disappearances in recent time, his older brother included, and to be careful. Six moths later, two bodies were found with a crossbow bolt through one's chest, in the dot heart, and the other was found with a bullet in the skull. They has armbands, with black and who's in each of them, and they were well camouflaged. One was IDED as the senior's older brother. He was round with a SKS carbine, bayonet fixed, with one round in the chamber, three missing from the magazine. Reports found blood on the bayonet. The other was IDD.ASA.Man from Oklahoma. He was found with a WASR with an empty chamber, and a full magazine in his hand. He also had an empty airsoft. Calister of 2000 BBS, with a wick inside it. It was filled with 6 ounces gunpowder, 15 small nails, and 200 steel BBS. It was a crude frag. Grenade. The bullet turned out to be a .30 to 40 from a crag rifle. So backup is 14 miles away and siding near a cop car isn't the brightest idea, I go in now all the comatushin was the previous night at 10 so just now I go out because the guy who called it in was scared after hearing all this and called again near a stream I found a rucksack with 2 AK mags, gauze, 12 ounces of booze, 2 bottles of water, and a pack of reds. First red flag, then I saw 3 sets of footprints lead through a trail, they looked a day old, they lead to a campsite that was still warm, at the camp I found 5 243 shell casings, 8 9mm casings, a 26.5 orange flare, a flare casing, and a sign of a scuffle, dirt kicked around like a fist fight. At the top of Ruby Ridge I found a bloodied rag, 6 308 shell casings that look like they've been through a G3, and a note on a piece of lined paper that said, I won, in caps and horizontally, Finding all this in 30 minutes and the fact the fire was still warm I was DEFCON 1, when 5 other guys got there we had detectives, show up, everybody knew what happened, the most dangerous game had just been played, to this day the winner is still at large. The second time was the same motherfucking place when we got the call from an anonymous caller at 11 pm our rudely formed SWAT team rolled out at 9 am the next morning to steamroll those motherfuckers, when we showed up it was creepy as shit, there was sounds of people moving around, but nobody was around, I guess the winner from the last go around wised up, there were four location of INT arrests, the first was a lone 1911 magazine, the second was a wallet with only cash and nothing else, no ID. The third was blood, grey matter, and bits of skill splattered on trees, it came from a woman. Third, was a man obviously deranged, you know that thousand yard stare? He was just walking around with a 1911 when we asked him if he was alright he raised the handgun and we light him up, the last one was the most chilling piece, there was another piece of paper next to an AR-15 mag, it read, the answers lie with the spared man. This was the last sporting event. Goodbye. To this day I have never trust the woods here in Oregon. Be me at 15. Live in Arkansas. Be summer. Be with fellow slash K slash omrads. Be in a woods for the night laying low after a long day of mischief. All of us carried weapons out into deep woods. My nugget, a 1911, an SKS, an old M1 carbine, and a double barreled 12 gauge. All of us sitting around campfire, enjoying nature and doing typical edgy teenager things.
1911 got some whiskey from his dad's boost stash. Score.jpg Start passing the bottle around. Wedgetinblitz.png Bottle was only quarter full, barely enough to get a buzz going among all of us. 1911 gets up to piss. Leaves 1911 in seed. Most guns are in tent anyway, except his. SKS leans over and picks it up. He never leaves this thing. Besides, it's dark out. Goes to catch up with 1911. M1 cracks a gay joke about SKS wanting 1911's dick. We all fucking knew it anyway. We wait for them to come back. And wait. Where the fuck are those two? Going for round three? Fuck sakes. Endurance run probably. More laughs. I'm getting worried. Someone needs to check on them. I dunno anon. If you're into that, then that's fine. I say let them stay out there until they are done. Roll eyes and acquire nugget from tent. Affix spike bayonet to push annoying brush out of way. You guys hang here, ID I'm not back in 10 come look for me. What? You're an exhibitionist now. More laughs. Fuck this, have to find SKS and 1911. Venture into brush that SKS and 1911 went into with flashlight on. Call out to them. No answers. Start getting nervous. The whole forest is fucking silent. Not good. Press on, with safety locked on nugget and finger far off the trigger. Ready to spear any would-be attackers. Call out again. Hear a scream. Goddamn SKS, we all knew you were a fucking girl, but you scream like one too. Feel relieved. Hey you two, stop being faggots for two seconds and at least tell me you're alright. Nothing. They must be afraid to admit it. Walk towards source of noise. Peek into thicker brush. See something moving around. SKS. 1911. Oh shit. Anon. It's SKS. Um. That's 1911. Not going to say anything, you're both fine. Turn to walk away. Flashlight dies. Fucking goddamn. Either of you have an extra flashlight. Could you turn around and give us a second on? We only have one light between us. Figures. Turn around. Hear some rustling and clothes being put back on. 1911 walks out with SKS close behind, with a light. We say nothing and walk back to camp. Reach camp. No one is there. Weird. I guess 12 gauge and M1 had ideas of their own. 1911 says with a laugh. Hear another scream. Not like the scream SKS made at all. A painful scream. That wouldn't stop for like two minutes. The fire starts to dim really fucking fast. SKS and 1911 are already geared up to start shooting. SKS is fucking crying his eyes out and staying close to 1911. Both rest of guns are in tent. Chairs are knocked the fuck over. Deep marks in the dirt where someone has been dragged off. Start following the trail. Ready to skewer whatever the fuck is out there. Boots land in something wet. 1911 and SKS catch up with flashlight. See deep red blood mixed in with the dust. Keep running down the markings in dirt. Realize my face had an appointment with the ground after tripping over something. Rifle went into underbrush. Look over to the thing I tripped on. It was M1 lying face down in a pool of blood coming from his shoulders. 12 gauge nowhere to be seen. Feel something latch onto shoulders. Cutting into my flesh. I look up and see it outlined against the night sky. Human head, long claws, fucking skinny arms. Hear 1911 and SKS shout and start unloading into it. Hear a screech in the darkness rapidly moving away from us. SKS truns over to help me up. 1911 tends to M1. I'm cut pretty bad on my right shoulder. M1 is out cold possibly dead. 12 gauge is missing in action. 
happening level, it's happening. Grope around for rifle. Find point of spike bayonet. Reach down farther. Screech comes back, this time coming towards us. Heft nugget from brush. Hold it by barrel. See the thing in the brief light of the flashlight. Swing the nugget like a baseball bat. Hear a sharp crack. Like bone shattering. Home fucking run. But plate hits it square in the skull. Whatever the fuck it was ran the hell off after that. 1911 picks M1 up. Stand up fully, and hold nugget correct way. We head back to camp to pack up. 12 gauges there pissing himself. Fire is out. Everyone rearms except M1, who is still out cold. Screech is heard again in rapid bursts. Coming towards us. We run deeper into the woods. We keep hearing it come closer and closer but going away. We find an advantageous position, a high outcropping of rocks. Only one way up and down. Build a fire right in the way of moving up and down pathway. Spend rest of night in a woods. Screeches would start and stop randomly. I would hear it scurry about the shadows. I would shoot at it every now and again. So would friends. Daylight comes. The screeches stopped hours before daylight. None of us had slept. M1 was in and out. In the relative safety of daylight we get the fuck out of the woods any direction to get us out. We found a road eventually. Began walking along it. Just our luck, fucking Humvee rolls up on us. Two MPs step out to see what the fuck is going on. Don't bother aiming weapons at us, could tell we had been through hell. Get taken back to army base. Had to give full statement about what went on. Uneasy looks from officers. Parents show up. No charges being filed. We were just some kids that went camping and let our imaginations go wild. M1 woke up in a hospital screaming his lungs out, still thinking he was in a woods. Parents were confused, but happy to see us alive. Ask me what happened. Make up something about it being a big dog. Seems to work well enough, we all say the same thing to our parents. They all buy it. We all refuse to go into those woods. My house is closest to them. Can occasionally hear the screech on the wind at the dead of night. Whatever that attacked us that night, is still out there. And wants me to know it. Every night I close my eyes I remember this night. My friends have long since moved away, and gone on to bigger and better things. We all remember what happened that night. I wish I could say it was a dog, really I do. I have tried to convince myself it was some woodland predator and in no way some abomination. But every time I try to do that, I hear it out there. What do I do slash k slash? I'm gonna dump one of my stories for y'all. I'll leave it up to you to believe it or not after your own mind but for me this was the biggest nope moment Rye had. Some background first. This happened in Boden, Sweden, a couple of years back. Baden is known for one thing, and one thing only, military forts. It was long thought of as the key to northern Sweden, the first thing the Soes would roflo stomp if they ever came charging. Those forts were secret as fuck in the past and for some time one of the forts were used to store a large part of Sweden's gold reserve. However, after the Cold War ended the forts became even more obsolete than before and were decommissioned. Anyway, the story. B21. Hang out with female friend that is more like the sister I never had. We are both scouts and have been for as long as we both can remember. Bored as fuck. Decide to go recon a cool campsite for the coming Halloween scare hike. My friend, let's call her age. Knows a lot of cool old forts and trench systems. Drive off in my car, which was perfectly fine and had gone through inspection without a hitch only a week before. Decide to check out the nearest old fort. Park the car a couple of hundred meters from the old fort because someone had placed biggest stones as a crude roadblock on the dirt road leading to the fort. The fort is dug like pick related with the exception that only there is no road up to the fort. Pick is another fort near Bowden. 
walk slash climb up to the fort from the right slope that's somewhat accessible. Any thoughts of recon for a campsite has soon been replaced by thoughts of exploration. It's about midday but the daylight is waning fast due to northern Sweden. Luckily we brought flashlights. Eventually locate a hole in the fence big enough for us to get through. Explore a bit, though all doors are locked either with massive padlocks or internal locks. Start to head back the way we came in. A thick door that we both were sure had been closed before is now slightly ajar. Not by much, just a couple of centimeters. We haven't heard any door opening or anyone else being here. This is a door about 1,5 m wide, 2,5 m tall and made entirely out of one decimeter of solid steel. And on rusty hinges it looks like remember that H told me before that the local wildlife seems to shun this place. 000k, getting a real bad feeling about this right now. We both keep our distance but our curiosity gets the better of us. We both try to peek inside. Pitch fucking dark inside. Except I, sense, something move inside. Don't really know how I know this but I just get a very weird feeling. Like something is staring at us from inside. We both aim our flashlight and thumb them on. Flashlights both give a short burst of light and then go dead as doorknobs. And we put in new batteries before we went out. In the short picosecond we have light I managed to get a glimpse of, something. A grey blackish humanoid shade that looks more like a beast than a man. At the same time something in my mind pushes the primal predator panic button. Nope 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 and 00000pe. I'm not sure what H saw but she is white as a flicking sheet and as damn near panic as I have ever seen her. We both scramble out without saying a word to each other. We both must have broken the record on 200m panic sprint. Don't know about H but I felt a something. Can't describe it more than a terrible sense of hate following us. Get in the car. I turn the key. Nothing. Try to turn it again the car won't start the headlight won't even turn on. Eventually after turning the key frantically again and again for the longest two minutes in my life the car starts. We get the hell out of dodge with gravel flying everywhere as I floor it until we get back on the main road. Later learned through other friends that there has been other similar occurrences there, some hearing a faint but very much mocking laughter coming from beyond that door and others feeling watched when they are near the fort, the door have never been ajar before or after though and it has always been locked when anyone has tried to open it. Has been 5 years since that happened. I can add that neither H nor I have been back inside the fence of that place. B13. Living in Mirandela a small city in the north of Portugal, pick related. Starting my ninth grade, decent circle of friends but nonetheless a bit of a loner most of the time. Notice a new girl joined the class. Cute brunette, also seemingly around my age, had a bit of a goth style to her, not to the point of piercings and black nails, but almost always dressed in black. Get paired up with her for a project on the first week and end up chatting, Find out we have the same taste in music and movies and inevitably become good friends. She was fatherless, moved into town with her mother recently. Ridiculously intelligent, far more than you'd expect from anyone her age, was even enthusiastic about philosophy and got me into reading Skopenhauer and Sartre, at fucking 13. Was also a loner, didn't hang out with many colleagues other than me, mainly because her long existentialist reflections seemed to bore everyone. Eventually became really close friends, almost platonic lovers. One day she invites me to her house for dinner. Actually a little surprised by how long it took to get invited to her place, given how often she dropped by mine. That evening we meet by the school and she leads the way. We start heading out of town. Half an hour later, we're walking around tall grass fields and dirt paths as night settles in. Can't help but feel a little scared since I don't want to be out in complete darkness, she tells me not to worry and kindly holds my hand. After maybe another half hour, with almost total darkness setting in. We follow a dirt road into a forested area. Fear is really kicking in. About to beg her to go back when she suddenly says we arrived. 
In front of us is an old, large, and degraded house, heavily obscured by darkness but nonetheless being a striking sight. Not exactly a mansion but still really large, with three floors and an old Alfa Romeo parked on the driveway. The door is unlocked, we walk in. She turns on the lights. The interior actually looks decent, lots of old furniture but all of it relatively well taken care of, unlike the torn up exterior implied. My fear turns into curiosity, can't help but feel intrigued by the house and bombard her with questions about it. The best she can say is that her mother got it as heritage from a distant uncle a few years ago and only now felt it would be fitting to move here. After showing me the bottom floor around, proudly displaying her collection of LPS and VHS in the living room, the 80s Philips VHS player was the closest to a modern apparatus in the entire house, and her packed up and thoroughly organized bookshelves in the office, she takes me to the dining room. Asks me to wait there while she goes upstairs to call her mother for dinner. As she leaves the room I contemplate how silent the house is. The only audible sounds being the tremulous treetops in the surrounding woods exposed to the wind and the light hum of an electricity generator probably around the back. Somewhat confused with the whole situation, but far more intrigued by my friend and her mother's eccentric lifestyle than scared by it. In a moment she comes back, tells me her mother is working in the attic and wants us to have dinner there. Now I'm really confused, what is her mother working on the attic and why can't she come down for dinner instead? She explains her mother is a dressmaker and uses the attic as her studio, and as such, spends the entire day there and doesn't want to interrupt her work to go downstairs. Unsatisfactory explanation, but alright. As we get to the upper floor I notice it is in significantly poorer condition than the lower, the walls of the corridor we pass by look slightly dirty and much of the wooden floor covering seems to be torn off. She tells me not to mind that division and explains her mother is still on the process of refurnishing the house. The attic stairs are at the end of the corridor. We climb them up. The attic is an ample but poorly lit space. I am assaulted by a labyrinth of dresses hanged in washing lines spread across the attic, most of them looking ripped and dirty, definitely unlike anything a dressmaker would be producing. A disgusting smell reeked across the room, I can't even properly describe how unpleasant it was. She just calmly makes her way through all the clothes, I try to keep up while covering my face in disgust. Hey, mom. Here's the friend I told you about. I hear my friend say. Finally come out at the end of the mess. Regret doing so in the following second as my brain processes what I'm suddenly looking at. Right in front of me is a morbidly decaying corpse, with almost more bone visible than the horrendous rotting flesh, sitting on a chair in front of a small table with a lit candle over it. I can't even properly react to what the fuck is this goddamn thing. Now that we're all together, we can finally have dinner at last, my friend says, seemingly talking to the rotting cadaver before her. Nope. Nope. Nope the fuck out. Heart pounding faster than it ever did in my entire life, run through the labyrinth of dresses and quickly head downstairs, rush to the front door of the house as fast as I can. She starts screaming angrily at me, I have no idea of what the fuck she's saying and I don't even take the time to listen to it. Smash through the front door. Run away into the surrounding forest with no idea of where to go. The only thing I can make out of all her spontaneous screaming is an almost tear jerk don't leave me as I rush into the woods. Run through the pitch black forest for what seemed like torturous hours for my young teenager brain, cry until I'm out of tears to pour out. End up finding a highway, the first driver that passes by and notices me on the side of the road miraculously stops and gives me a ride back into town. Get back home, parents are surprised to hear me arrive close to midnight but immediately understand something happened as soon as they see me walk into the living room covered in sweat, with my clothes torn up from running through the middle of the woods. Tell them the shit I went through. Needless to say, they were skeptical about such an absurd sounding story, but nonetheless presumed that, was I telling the truth, I must have been the victim of a prank from her, eventually involving a false corpse dummy or similar. 
decide they are going to talk with our teachers to track down her parents and shed some light on her inappropriate attitude. They go to the school the next day to clear it up, far too damn scared to leave my house. And at the same time I was terrified to be in my house given she knew where I lived, invited over the beefiest friend I had at the time under the paranoia of her showing up. Parents came back. Told me she was registered into school by her mother during early summer vacations. The school management wasn't able to contact the mother ever since, no phone calls were picked up and, given no one understood where her address was located, all letters were returned to sender. Give how many problems the lack of contact with her mother was causing, they tried calling the girl to clear everything up on that exact moment, but she was missing that day. And so was she missing throughout the rest of the week. And so was she missing throughout the next week. And so was she missing throughout the rest of the month. Final. Was invaded by a mist of self-concern and a legitimate concern for her, on one hand my juvenile couldn't help but imagine she could be up to something, on the other hand I was seriously worried about her and fearing for what could have happened to that poor desperate lunatic. We tried filing a missing person report to the police, but we didn't have her face, hardly knew anyone who spoke to her and still weren't capable of reaching her mother, it eventually ended up being futile when we had nothing but her name to prove she even existed. She was never heard of again. It's been close to an entire decade since that happened. Some years after I moved to the capital, Lisbon, but I still often go north to visit my family and I still know that town like the palm of my hand. And I still have no idea where that damn house of terror is. I have something. Be me, last summer. Be wanting to complete stalker challenge. Abandoned cement barge beached on a sandbar on wooded coastline. Seems like the perfect place to camp. Brought a WASR, two magazines, all the magazines I had at the time, was perfect. Went to check out this barge, it was pretty sick. There were barnacles growing on some of it, so I assumed that, at high tide, it was partially submerged. It had a cargo hold, and an upper deck. There were two portholes in the upper deck, with rusty ladders that descended down into the cargo hold. Decided to camp on the beach where the sandbar connects with dry land, because I didn't want to drown in my sleeping bag if high tide completely covered the vessel somehow. Explored the barge just a little more first. Noticed some rusted out metal stuff in a little square pool on the upper deck. Reached down into the water, pulled out a rifle casing. Recognized it as a nugget food casing. Wait till slash k slash hears about this. Finally get finished closely examining all the cool old rusted bits of the barge. Valves, moorings, etc. Head over to the beach to make camp. Paste it off, it's 60 or so yards from the barge. Not quite stalker challenge legal, but safety first, right? What's 10 yards? Make a little fire pit with rocks for shiggles. Put driftwood in it. Whipped out the zippo, lit her up. Looked at my watch, it was about 4. Pick related kind of shows the shoreline I was camped on. Pick related also shows the part of the upper deck where the barge was split in two. Anyhow. Sitting on the beach, in front of weak ass fire. WAS are laying by my side. Pull out a green plastic dollar store harmonica. No idea how to play it, just make noises with it. Start doing the Jaws theme with it, for shiggles. Laugh at my own cleverness. Try to do something like the national anthem. Hear laughter coming from the trees. Stop playing, look over. Hello. Laughter continues, same tone as before. It kind of sounds like me, come to think of it. Begin to smell something kind of metallic. Smell is kind of salty, too. I was camped by the sound, mind you, so it was already a little salty, but this smell was saltier than normal. It's still only five, not quite sundown. I'm scanning the tree lean, but I don't see nothing. Reach for my harmonica to resume playing. Realize the salty, metallic smell kind of resembles blood. In fact, 
it strongly resembles the smell of blood. Same laugh comes from the woods. Begin to put two and two together. Chamber around in the WASR. Hello. Sit there, staring at the woods for a long ass time. Nothing. Cook my beans on the fire, glancing over at the woods periodically. Just as the sun is going down, hear hello. Come at me from the woods. That sounds a lot like me. Nope the fuck out of there. JPEG. Packed my shit in a flash, ran to the barge. Pick related was taken two weeks prior, while hiking with a buddy. We spent all of five minutes there and continued on our way. Anyways. Darted to the barge. Leapt inside. Frantically climbed up onto upper deck. Jumped across the crack onto the bow. Went prone, aimed my WASR back out across the sandbar. Eyes golf ball wide. Sit like that a while. Check watch periodically. Just as the sun is finishing setting, realize I'm going to want some fire. Go down onto the sandbar, rifle slung and at the ready, gather up a little driftwood. Light a rather weak fire on the deck. Make one last trip just at the beginning of dusk, find some good wood, fire achieves respectable size. Spend a the first few hours of the night rifle shouldered, prone, aiming down the sandbar, Remember that several of my relatives suffer various mental illnesses. You probably just hallucinated that sh asterisk t, anon, you need to go get checked out I tell myself. Then I hear the heavy breaking of brush from the coastline. And something muffled blows to me on the breeze. Laughter. And a pretty unpleasant smell. Oh shit. Hold my rafotite, pointed threateningly at the coast. It's pretty well dark by now. Remember I brought a flashlight. Go over to my pack, laying on the deck by the stern, get it. Come back, shine it down along the sandbar. See something glint as I sweep. Swing beam back onto the gleaming thing. Two little dots. Eyes. Fucking eyes. Something big and dark is attached to them. It's pretty damn tall. It's just standing there, halfway down the sandbar. Can't see it well, low battery and it was kind of far away. Try to tell myself it's just an animal. That's one big ass animal. Is it a bear? Human eyes don't glow in the dark, so it can't be a person. Can't hurt to shoot at it, right? Chamber around. A live round is ejected and skitters across the deck. I already chambered one on the beach. I'm a dumbass. Go prone, take aim, touch one off. If only I had had a flash hider instead of a slanted break. Blinded for what felt like an eternity. Blinking frantically in hopes of restoring my sight the whole time. Get to the point where I can see again. Frantically shine my mag light all up and down the sandbar, no eyes. Maybe I scared it off. Hear the crunching of gravelly sand below me. Somebody says hello, once again, it sounds a hell of a lot like me. In full panic mode. Stand on the railing, point WASR over the side, mag dump. <laughs> Hear and see nothing for a good long while. Settle in. Got my legs in a sleeping bag, head and arms out with with WASR aimed at the portholes that lead from the hold up onto the deck. A couple of hours pass, my eyelids get heavy. Hear that laugh again, this time, it's below me. Nearly wet myself in sheer terror. Begin focusing intently. Hear small waves lapping up against the side of the barge. The tide has risen. After 10 minutes or so, begin to hear sloshing in the hold below. Something's walking around down there, and it's beginning to fill with water. There's only one direction this can go now. Up. Oh shit oh shit oh shit oh shit. Hello. Scream shut the fuck up. Shove my WASR down the porthole. Blind fire like a madman. There goes all of my ammo. Heart is hammering. Slowly back away from the porthole. Heart something clanging against metal. It's climbing the ladder. 
unsheath my bayonet. I don't know how that thing fit through the porthole, but it did. Fight or flight engages, there's nowhere to run to. Charge, screaming. It happened in a flash. The bayonet plunged into the thing. A heavy paw, or something, bitch slapped me across the chest and I went tumbling off the barge, into the drink. I now have no WASR, and I'm in the water. Play dead, lay on my back, hope it doesn't see me. Heart is pounding uncontrollably, still. Not worried about hypothermia because it's June. Slowly drift away with the current. See a hulking silhouette next to the fire as I drift off. Current dumps me on a beach a few miles east. Hike home, never go near that place again. Alright gun fuckers, here's one that happened a few summers ago. Live out near Texarkana. Parents have farm with a few cows, horses, and too many chickens to count. Farm sits on the boundary between woods and plains, trees are sparse but thicken up like crazy toward back of property. Parents gone to Corpus Christi for vacation, so of course I have to take care of all the animals. Tack the heat wave passing through onto that, and it's basically constant care making sure they're watered. My favant.og Closest friends are out of town for the week. Farm is about 20 miles outside city limits, so I can rule getting my dick wet out of the roster of activities. Split time up between feeding aminals and siding in my new SIG 556 I got for graduation. Wake up one morning, one of our older horses had died. She had plenty of water, but the heat must have just been too much for her, poor girl. I phoned dad, he tells me to go to neighbor Frank a few miles down the road, he has a backhoe. Go to Frank, tell him my situation. He follows me back home with the thing and fills me in on how to operate, not too different from a tractor so I'm set tells me he'll be back the next morning for the backhoe. Set to work digging Empress grave, fill it in, offer a moment of silence, shed a manly tear. Suddenly inspiration wave. Turn the backhoe back on and chug a lug to the back of the property. 30 plus acres and not a single berm for shooting? Madness. Don't bother telling parents because they wouldn't give a fuck. Start digging a berm, leave the trench forest side. Suddenly smell this dank, shifty odor. Panic and think I hit a sewer line. 11 gone a jetty jiff. Hop down out of cab and search the trench for busted pipe, none to be found. Suddenly feel uneasy, feeling of being watched. Scan tree lean and surrounding field. Zip. Chalk it up to dead horse and residual guilt, but still tactically back to backhoe. Gladl left it running. Text. Chug a lug back to farm, turn it off and head inside. Get up early next morning, make a big country breakfast and go out to feed some motherfucking critters. Go out to do the horse's routine, but with one less chunk of hay on the wheelbarrow. Sad face PNG. Suddenly waft a most unpleasant vapor. That smelly smell from yesterday, mixed with rot. Head out on a hunch to where I buried Empress. Stagger and nearly puke. The grave's been robbed. Her head has been placed, emphasis on placed, upright near a large-ish hole in the ground. Tongue has been ripped out, eyelids gone, and eyes been popped, her cheeks and neck look chewed on. Maggots crawling around the wounds. Vitreous humor dry and crusty running down one cheek seen dead animals and scavenging before, this trumps all in my book. Plus, I loved that horse so this is disturbing on a number of levels. Hear squealing sound behind me, break my shorts. It's neighbor Frank. He asks why I look so pale, tell him coyotes dug up the horse. Bullshit. I dug that grave at least seven feet deep. He nods and leaves with backhoe, I play car shuffle again to get him back to his truck. Get home, carefully tip Empress head back down the grave with a shovel and rebury her. Go into garage, slop some coyote urine around grave to keep the fuckers away, it pays to have a family as into hunting as mine. Fast forward to that afternoon. 
head out on four-wheeler with a few targets, my SIG, and my moist nugget, trashy, yes. Cheap. Also yes, for a little side calibration. Go to set up targets, realize I didn't bring anything to actually set them up on. Punch self. Go into trees to grab some sticks. As I approach, get the same feeling as the day before. Go into trees, grab some suitable sticks, and do the nope scoot back to my site. Whittle sticks into stakes, make shift a few targets into side of berm, get my SIG calibrated to within acceptable parameters and operate on the clean target for a few minutes with the nugget. After a while, realize it's getting dark. Is the beer there any good? Believe it or not, I wasn't really into underage drinking. Decide to take targets and shit down, clean up my brass and head back. Leave no trace. BSA. As I'm taking the targets down, the afternoon breeze shifts and suddenly stank. Hear movement from other side of berm and nearly nope a small but sturdy wall in my pants. Decide not to be a pussy, grab my sig and climb the berm to have a little peek. See medium sized black shape huddled down in the trench. Aren't you cute.jpg? Figure it's a black bear cub or something, they're more common than most folks realize, and back away slowly in case mom is nearby. Clumsy ham hand accidentally a shower of dirt onto the cub. It looks up at me. That's no cub mp4. Let me just say that while I'm not the original badass, creepy or spooky images and shit don't frighten me that easily. Shit, when I was little one of my favorite pets was delightful, an older Welsh pony with no eyes, her eye holes were, in fact, sewn over and sunken in. She made one of my friends cry just by looking at him. That being said, this thing was on a completely other level, spectrum, and set of physics from that sweet old pony. Best way I can describe it is comparing it to PLC related, jaw was a bit thinner, eyes were beadier and darker, and the nose was more sunken back, but the rest of the details are pretty close. Same drooly mouth, same slack jawed grin, same snargly ass teeth. At this point, my brain made an executive order to re-examine my previous decisions. Fuck the targets, fuck the brass, fuck the scouts, fuck not being a pussy, and fuck slow going. I tactically back to the inn, spent 0.000001 of a second making sure my guns are stowed securely and gun that shit back to the garage. Once inside with a good 8 acres between me and the fuck beast of Pelosidar I realize that I have a sworn duty to protect my farm. I already let one of my charges die under my watch. It's time to nut up or shut up. Q underscore arming underscore sequence. Grab my dad's tack vest, have to cinch it a little tight, and his Night Owl 5X, load up with 320 RDAR 15 mags loaded with 5.56 NATO, slap the third into my SIG and sling my new gun over my shoulder. My nugget takes mags, so I put one in with 5 to spare on my vest and shouldered that bad boy. Fuck me, I even slipped a knife into my boot. There are floodlights strung up about the farm for entertaining or night work, switches are in the garage and balcony. Go for I ground JPG. I tactically threw the house to the balcony and get ready for war. Not a moment too soon, start hearing squawks and gurgles and, I still get the giblies to this day, laughter coming from the chicken pen. Fuck this. I slam every switch and light up the farmyard like Rockefeller Square on Christmas. There it is, standing in the pen like PLC related. Its body was shaped like a fucking cush ball, all matte black fur. Arms and legs were thin, but looked powerful and wiry. It was holding one of the hens with its head torn off, and staring straight at me. It was obviously a male of whatever the fuck species it was, and there was fucking blood hanging off its shifty beast cock. I unslung my sig and mag dumped, not worrying about hitting anything, trying to hit that black cotton ball on stilts. I remember thinking I hope I blow your shifty cock off, you piece of slime, yes, the words my brain used were piece of slime. I scored at least 5 or 6 good THWUCKs, my target being only about 50 yards downrange. 
it never moved the entire time, puffs of fur flying off of it. I ejected the mag, slapped a new one in, and took aim again. I'll never forget the look it gave me, framed by that green sight. It almost said are you done. I squeezed off a final shot at its fucking mouth. I hit it. I fucking know I hit it. I remember it almost in slow motion, the puff of fucking saliva and shit as my 5.56 NATO round introduced itself to its face at 3000 feet slash s. The thing started wheezing. Like a rusty gate being swung back and forth, that kind of ee sound. It dropped the hen and stepped over the chicken fence. I swear to fuck that this thing has either retractable legs, or its body is mostly puffy fur, because when it stepped over the fence, that leg almost disappeared. I wasn't gonna let it run away. Mag dump 2, the redumpening. I didn't score any hits though. Once it was over that fence, it dropped to all fours and scuttled off like some giant spider back to the crack in Satan's couch, all while wheezing that eeeee -e -e noise. I stayed up all that night, waiting for it to come back. Fed the animals with my sig over my shoulder, went to sleep, repeated the process until my parents came home. Never saw the chicken fucking shit weasel again. So, slash k slash, what's your take? Well, I have a story from when I was about 14 years old. I'm in my 30s now so I can't say every line is perfectly accurate, but you'll get it. Also, all names are fake. Don't be mad. Be me. Be obsessed with outdoors as shit. Be in Cub Scouts as a young boy and currently in Boy Scouts. Want to be an Eagle Scout so fucking badly. I knew every goddamn knot in the book. One week a bunch of us go camping into some woods in bumfuck Indiana. As Boy Scouts tend to fucking do. We're a troop of 12 kids. One of the kids dad was our scout leader. He was there too. So we set up our tents probably about a mile into the woods. And we just fuck around all day the first day. Me and two kids go out on a secret mission to see if we could find the river. We'll call the kids Steve and Logan. So we're just walking along the path when Logan decides he wants to fucking race us. He bolts ahead and we chase after him. He looks right and comes to a complete stop. Just staring at something in the trees. We get up to him and look. There's a fucking deer smashed against a boulder. This thing looks like it got hit by a semi. We go up to look at it but immediately turn away due to the smell. It's starting to get kinda dark. We're not supposed to leave the group. We run back to the campsite as fast as our little feet can carry us. Stay up for hours talking about the deer to the other kids. Next morning was canoe day. We all walked down the same path the three of us went down yesterday. I try to see the deer as soon as we reach that part of the trail. It's gone. Not the deer itself. The fucking boulder was missing. This thing was the size of a goddamn minivan. And something moved it away. Silently freak the fuck out and keep walking. Get down to the building with all the water gear in it. Scout leader counts how many of us there are in order to get the right amount of canoes. He gets out five three-seater canoes. We all get in and one of the kids rides with him to break the odd number of scouts up. Get back on dry land and begin walk back to campsite. Talk about the canoeing shit on the way back. Logan Steve and I were in one of the first boats to leave. So we start asking everyone who they were with. Most of the kids are able to say who they canoed with. And of course the scout leader's son went with him. Wait. Trent and Bill can't figure out who was with them. They swear there was a third guy in. Their boat. I do a quick head count. Hold the fucking phone dot jpeg. There's 12 kids. One scout leader. He got out five three-seater boats. And we had one too many kids so one had to ride with him. That means there was an extra scout. Someone else was in the canoe with Trent and Bill. Get back to camp. Nobody believes Trent or Bill. They refuse to. I speak up and explain the math problem. Everyone gets quiet. 
Scout leader tries to regain control. All right. Tonight. We all sleep in the mess hall. We gather all of our shit and bring it inside the dining area. Some kids are so freaked out they sleep underneath the tables. Most don't sleep at all. I stayed up all night looking out the window. Watching and waiting for someone to sneak up on us. Eventually pass out from pure exhaustion and get like 20 minutes sleep before it's time to get up. Scout leader tells us what happened yesterday was one of the boats must have been a two-seater on accident and we were just confused. Says not to worry and we'll all be fine. Nobody believes him. But we pretend like we do to keep from shitting ourselves. Go about the day's normal activities without anything too crazy happening. That night we light a fire outside and start telling scary stories. Spend all night out by the campfire just having a chill time. We all scoot our tents in closer to the fire and just kinda enjoy the night. I think the fire made us feel safe. Which was an unfounded and dumb thing to feel. Because of fucking course. We weren't what the fuck. Uh oh. Drank too much lemonade. Tell Scout Master I have to pee. He gives me the key to the mess hall. I go inside and relieve myself. Logan and two other kids come inside her after me and grab some bread to make toast with. Come back to the fire after locking the building up. Begin consuming burnt bready goods. We're moving through bread fairly quickly. Say to Logan. Didn't you guys all grab a loaf? He says yeah and reaches for the third one. It's not there. He starts flipping shit over looking for it. Asks who the fuck just took the last loaf of bread. Nobody has it. I ask him. Who all went in with you? He says well it was George and, George who was with us. George gets real fucking quiet and suddenly a wave of fear washes over him. He starts fucking panicking. Somebody snuck in and stole a bread loaf right along with them. Some person who was dressed like a scout. That was the final straw for our scout leader. Decides to cut the trip short. Next morning we all go to the van to leave. A few kids run independent head counts to ensure it's just 12 of us. We're all here. No more. No less. We all pile into the van and get the fuck out of Dodge. Get home and tell my mom we cut it short because there was a bear that stole some food from a tent. Too dangerous to stay. She bought it. About two hours later my mom comes in my room and asks me. Steve's parents want to know if he went straight home or did he go anywhere else after getting out of the van. Think about it. I didn't see Steve get out of the van. Come to think of it. I don't remember sitting next to Steve. Did Steve even get in the fucking van? We counted 12 scouts. There were 12 of us. He had to be there. Wait. Holy fucking shit. Tiff. Mom calls scout leader. Tells him what we think happened. He drives back to the camp. Finds Steve barricaded in the mess hall. He took off for one final piss break. And we left without him. There was someone in the fucking van with us. Some other kid that nobody noticed. And like three people did head counts. Nobody fucking noticed the stranger. Whoever this fucker is he's in the city now. Talk to Steve a few days later. He says he heard growling outside the doors. Like there was a pack of dogs trying to speak English. Tell him he sounds crazy and say I don't believe him. But I fucking believe him. I never had any other troubles with whoever it was. Must have fucked off back to the woods or moved deeper into the city. Be me. Camping in a woods with my longtime best friend for a week. He's got around 50 acres that spills into straight forest. Just the basics, tin food, water, that kind of shit. Sleeping in the bed of my truck because poor fig, no money for tent or camper. First day goes well enough, talk the day away while we fished. Head to bed, cap truck off in case rain. Sleep like a little baby bitch. Wake up around 7 or 8, debate getting a fire going to cook breakfast. Friend tells me he's gonna start prepping food, 
and I need to get firewood. Walk off into woods with shitty little Coleman's hatchet. Start breaking down little dead trees, get an armful of wood before I head back. Super uneasy feeling, like when you fuck up and you know it. Like someone took everything out of my stomach and replaced it with primal fear. Sketched out, but think nothing of it. Head back to camp with wood and spooks. Cook breakfast. Consisted of warmed up canned ravioli. Not buying ice and a cooler so I can eat fucking eggs in the woods. Eat our fill, pack up leftovers and head hiking. Made sure to pack stuff back into truck and lock it. Hike for about an hour, stop in a clearing and enjoy the view. Nothing but long grass in the middle and trees all around us. Broke back mountain. If enjoy the air, head back into the woods. Hiking back, food sitting like a fucking brick in stomach. Walk for what feels like hours. Oh shit, what time is it? Check watch, only around 2 or so. Not bad, left at 11. Wait, shouldn't we be at camp? And why does nothing look familiar? Panic mode engaged. Freak out to friend, gonna die in the woods. He says we're fine, camp shouldn't be too far. Walk for maybe 15, 20 minutes more. Oh shit there it is. No problems here. Unlock truck, turn on radio to cool nerves. Not too far out, shitty signal but enough to get something. Relax for a couple hour talking about love life and shit. No girl for my own, but wait Evs. Don't want ravioli again, go fishing for dinner. Down at pond from yesterday trying to catch something worth eating. Nothing so far, the entire pond seems dead still. Whatever, it's the evening, lots of critters to disturb the water. Managed to catch two or three little fish, not sure what type but no bigger than hand. How do I skin a fish? Webm. Bring back to camp, enjoying how quiet it is out. Get back and start skinning and deboning fish. Feel uneasy, but think nothing of it. Chomping down on fish, can't stop thinking about how still pond was. Friend breaks the silence. Shit man, you were gone for a while. Not a lot of luck today. Not, nah, swear to god it was like there were no fucking fish in there today, spooky as fuck. The entire forest seemed kinda quiet today. Sit and ponder for a bit. Did I hear and birds on the way back? No, I don't think I did. Was there any wind at all? Any breeze? Shit, I don't think there was that either. Not liking this one bit. Don't wanna pussy out on friend by calling it quits this early. Whatever, I'm just tired. Fix mattress in the bed of my truck for the night. No homo. Make a little fire and start burning shit to pass the time. Just doesn't feel right. Ask friend if he's ever gone this far back here. Yeah, I used to come back here with my dad all the time. Little backstory here, friend's parents died about a year ago, super fucking loaded. Left house to him, money to other family. Ask if he had any spooks back this far. Says nothing too bad, the worst was this hermit that lived about two or three miles out past the property line. He didn't bother them, they didn't bother him. Shrug it off, and head to bed. Wake up around 2 or 3. Shivering like a motherfucker, it's bad. Lay under the blanket for a bit. Decide fuck it, I'm gonna walk around to try and wear myself out and fall back asleep. Climb out of bed, careful not to wake friend. Not a dumb ass so I make sure to keep tent in view. Walking in place, enjoying the stars and crickets. Hear something off in the distance. My mind playing tricks on me. Strain my ears to listen better. Crickets. 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 Silence. Ungodly moaning slash muffled screaming. Shit my ass as I rush to wake up friend. Nigga get the fuck up. Immediately tell him to be quiet and listen. He hears it too, can't be too far off with how muffled it sounds. Imagine covering your mouth with a pillow and screaming into it. 
like pure screams, enough to crack your voice. Now play that far off into the woods, just barely loud enough to hear. Stomach is a swirling mess of emotions and shit, not sure what to do. Friend tells me they've got lots of coyotes back here, maybe one of them got a hold of a fox and killed it. Yeah, maybe. Sounds vaguely sentient though, like it's pleading. Lay in bed listening to the screams for what feels like forever, before finally passing out. Wake up next morning exhausted. Mind cloudy, can't think to save my life. Go take a piss out in the woods. Crunching leaves.mp3. Hairs on back if neck stand up, fight or flight activating. It's my friend getting sticks to make another fire. Well what happened to the firewood from before? Up and left, must have burned through it all. Wait shit, I get cell reception out here. Remember friend telling me about fox screams last night? Google fox scream human. Videos of vixen screams. Watch then. They sound close, but something about it seems, too animal. Like it didn't have that fear behind it. Chalk it up to being tired. The rest of the day was the usual stuff, start fire, cook food, hike a bit, swim in pond some, make bed for night. Laying in bed, refusing to fall asleep for fear of getting fucking gutted by skinwalkers or some shit. Hear the crickets again, something about it is just so calming to me. About to fall asleep when I hear it. Muffled screams like before, only clearer. Swear on my life I can hear something behind it. Can only make out the stronger parts of the word. Like a drawn out a noise, or something. Eyes are welling up with tears, I don't wanna die man. Sit in bed until sun comes up. Decide fuck it, we got today and tomorrow and we're gone. I want to know what this noise is. Tell friend I want to head out back towards the opening we found. Seems uneasy about it, but agrees. Walking out, no talking between the two of us. Lifelong friends, this shit doesn't happen often. Always something to talk about. Around halfway their friend falls and twists ankle pretty bad. God fuck it, why now? Help him back to the truck and set him in passenger seat. Wait with him to make sure he's okay. Gradually gets more and more pasty. Cold skin, like a fever feeling. Fuck nigga that's no good. Sit with him and talk, I want my bro to be okay. No good food to comfort, just ravioli and potted meat. Lap of luxury. Talk over our options. He can barely walk, so it wouldn't be easy getting him from A to B. And I really want to check out that noise from earlier. Fuck man, what do? Fuck it, I have this unexplainable pull towards this. Tell him I'll be right back, and book it out. Sprinting through forest, I need to know what this is. Get to clearing in maybe half hour, so not too bad considering the distance from camp. Again, no birds, no ambient noise. Just pure, piercing silence. Don't feel safe in the slightest, but I want answers. Cross cleaning into other section of woods. Much denser, light peeks through but in very small spurts. Kinda like a basement in the evening, seeable but dark. Walking super carefully, I don't fuck with no spirits. See a little cairn about 30 feet out, go check it out. Blue rags, long stringy black hair, and an ungodly smell. Pull rags out, they're made of denim. Okay fuck this shit. Tree niggas got burial mounds covered in tattered clothes and hair. Nope the fuck out. Running through clearing, stop to catch breath. Now to get a scale of things, the clearing was maybe a football field and a half, and I am not a runner. Winded and gasping. All of a sudden hear that scream as clear as day. Whip head around. Tall gaunt woman-like figure standing in tree line. I freeze up, this is how it ends. Feel intense wave of calm wash over me, I'm safe here. I want to go to her, learn who she is. Very beautiful, and seemingly angelic in nature. 
All but forget about sick and dying bro. Fuck, I need to get back. Turn around to run and I hear it. Branches snapping, grass rustling. Oh sweet dick I'm gonna die here. Run faster than a fucking Olympian athlete. Legs taking me Mach 7, down through my trail. Entire time nothing but sobbing and moaning from behind me. Gradually slows down, like I got a tether and kept going. Stop to catch my breath about 5 minutes from camp. Back to a tree, don't want to ghost bitches sneaking up on me. Gasping and panting. Feel hand on shoulder. It's bro. Freak out, start talking a million miles a minute. See this ungodly fear in his eyes, he says nothing to me. Walk back to camp, scared shitless. Bro won't say anything to me as we pack up. Car drive home. Spend the night at my place cause he says he wants time away from his home. Up until maybe two talking each other down. All of a sudden bursts into hysterics. Blabbering fool, sounds like a toddler learning to speak. Calm him down, ask him what the fuck he's doing. Says he got spooked after the second night of screaming, he had heard it too. Set his phone to record audio during our sleep. Schemed through it in the hour I was gone. Says he got about through about 4 hours of cherry picked sound when he saw something out of the corner of his eye. Super fast blur, long arms, skinny body, dark hair. Said he heard some kind of unholy laughter as it left, like it was playing a game. Ran in my direction. He couldn't do anything, twisted ankle and sickness. Kept listening to audio. Around what would be 5 am hears rustling in recording. Uneven gait, like. Step, step step step, step. Giggling almost like a child stops after a while rattling and the sound of my truck bed opening rusting shortly afterwards and what sounds like cooing like a mother soothing a child zipper unzipping cloth tearing bed latching sprinting check back missing a pair of jeans wait just a fuck cairn in the forest fucking clothes inexplicable pull oh god whatever that thing was made a fucking burial site for me why why fucking why freak out lock doors close blinds sit in bedroom with friend sit there until morning and drive back to house entire place is torn up glass shattered furniture torn doors scratched it was looking for us here. Not enough money in the world would get friend to stay here, and not enough to get me to let him. Pack what little he can salvage and bring him back to my house. This was maybe a month ago. Dude's been staying here while we try to figure out what to do. May just tear the place down and sell the land, no way we're going to try and fix it up to sell it. Still have no clue what that woman was, but I know for a fact it wasn't anything I want to remember. I'll try to answer and questions as best I can. Come home from drinking with my buddies, buzzed and getting tired. See my wife walking to the bedroom, it's bedtime for her too. Laying in bed with wife. We're talking in the dark as is our nightly routine. She leaves to use the restroom. Comes back about one minute later, closes and locks the door as usual lays down in bed again she likes to sleep with her arm over me and head in my neck attempt to talk with her no response assume she's fallen asleep start nodding off brain thinking of stupid shit like elephants doing backflips snap out of my sleep bedroom door knob is jiggling look at the door and hear my wife on the other side say Stop playing let me in. Shit bricks dot if. Look down at my sleeping wife. Can barely make anything out because of the dark. Slip out from under her and turn on the light. Look back at her, no one's there. Look around the room, wife starts getting pissed and demanding I let her in. Go to open the door. Pitch black of the hallway, no one's there. Shit mar bricks dot if. 
suddenly sober up and realize my wife is working a double shift. Drown underscore in underscore bricks underscore I underscore chat dot gif. This would fuck with me. Here's a story that I've never shared before. It's not really paranormal, but it scares the living shit out of me. 17 years old, been smoking weed regularly with a couple of guys from college, I'm from the UK, we start college at 16, for a year now. One of the guys usually drives and we smoke up in this field that's deserted at night. Driver gets a call from someone. He starts freaking out, literally laying on the floor screaming down the phone. Never heard screaming like that before, it was fucking terrifying. He's not even making sense, he's like writhing around on the floor and screaming down the phone. Starts doing this weird fucking laughing, all bug-eyed and weird. Calmly puts his phone in his pocket. Climbs very tall fence for a tennis court. Jumps off, lands on his neck and fucking kills himself. Guy I hung around with every day for a year just UPS and kills himself because of a phone call and none of us know who it was on the other end. I wish I was making this up, but it fucked me up for a while afterwards. The other guy we were with started using ketamine regularly. We're both 21 now and he's completely screwed in the head. I was on medication for a while afterwards, shitty Cytolopram, but came off it quickly. The police put it down to a stoned idiot climbing the fence, they interviewed us both once and that was it. I never even heard from his family, they moved out of the county pretty quickly. I still have his younger brother on Facebook. I buried the memory somewhere in my brain and just try to ignore it, but whenever my phone rings and I don't have the number saved then I always get a horrible feeling and I never answer. I'm not even explaining how fucking weird this guy was acting when he answered his phone, it was horrible. The fucking noises he was making were so fucking disgusting. I can't even try to explain it because it makes me feel physically sick. Be demon. Minding my own business on the third plane, doing infernal shit. Suddenly my pocket vibrates. You have one message. Oh great Surix Blurg, PLS come to my house and give me wisdom or money or anything really. How about no? Continue about my eternal night. Suddenly, an arch demon appears. Surix Blurg, you must go to that human's house and impart wisdom upon him, but do it in a spooky and cryptic way. He has scribbled the correct sigils on a roll of vellum with goat's blood so you know he's serious, off you go. It's the demon code. Man fucking why, I'm not even dash. I said it's the demon code. Whatever. Show up at this fag's house around midnight. Surix Blurg, you're here. Tell me, will I find the love of my life? Sure kid. Make his furniture jiggle around a little bit. Return to the screaming abyss. MFW. Be me, 17, go on a backpacking trip over the summer through a school program. Me and like 10 other kids in Mount Skokomish wilderness with a ranger and an intern. The ranger was a 60 year old man, really quiet and kind of grouchy, the intern was some college girl pursuing a job like him. Hike and camp for about four days, not much happens. Occasionally catch the ranger checking out some of the girls at the camp, don't think much of it. He only ever talks to the intern. About midway through the whole thing we all smell terrible, but getting used to it, important. Late one night, really windy I have my flashlight and go to take a dump in the woods. Go to the latrine, on my way back, when I smell something fucking nasty. Like I said we were used to the smell of bow and this definitely wasn't bow. Start following the smell in the dark, tripping over logs and shit, don't intend to go very far. Pass a tree and the ranger is just standing still beside me like a statue. Says pretty warm out huh. Just sort of stand there, he goes walking back to the campsite and says the latrine is the other direction. The smell is still fucking awful so I pretend to walk to the latrine but once he's gone I go back and follow the smell. It gets really bad, it smells like really sour shit and vomit. Follow it, gagging, until I come across a little clear patch of ground. 
The intern is totally naked, sitting in a pile of her own shit, vomit, and blood crying, totally smeared in all of it. A few bloody, shitty sticks right beside her. She's just crying with her legs spread and sort of shaking. I ask if she's okay, she says yes. Ask if I can help, she says no. Walk back to camp fucking terrified and guilty. The ranger is in his tent I guess because I can't find him around camp. Go into my tent and turn out flashlight. Lie there for a while, can't sleep. Hear big footsteps walking away from right near my tent, I was near some trees so I guess he was standing outside of my tent for a while. Don't sleep at all. The next day, eventually find her filtering water, ask if she's okay. She says she doesn't know what I'm talking about and to go help the others make dinner. The rest of the trip I literally cannot get within 10 feet of her, she's just always not near me. She and the old ranger dude are really talkative. He's really friendly, compliments my outdoor skills a lot, etc. Hike out eventually and go to a ranger station slash lodge for a night before driving out. There's an older woman ranger there, I tell her everything that happened, she seems very concerned and takes my phone number. That night I go to shower, come back and find my room and all my belongings totally raided. Say fucking nothing to anyone the whole drive back to Boise. This was before Facebook. I've tried to look some of them up since but only ever had luck with the intern, who I eventually think I found on a USFS website by pure chance when I was researching something totally different. It only had the first name listed but the face looked right. It may interest some of you. It's not really much of a story. Not yet. The thing is, in city I live there are many old abandoned factories, some of they were like that for decades. I'm living in a district where there are a few near me. Some of them were demolished and some renewed and there are now apartments in them. But among them there are few that for some reason was left untouched. I once decided to get into one of them, it was quite small, once a shoe factory or some shit like that. We managed to break in and pick related. So yeah, first floor was kind of disappointing. Nothing really interesting there. And really there wasn't access for the whole building. The end was the bigger room with W pile of rubbish. And a hole in a wall. We presumed it's the way up and we were not wrong. All we had to do was to stockpile some stuff near it and somehow squeeze through. Okay I got one from recently. This is where the it hit me, later friend told me he felt the same. That fucking uneasy feeling. There was something wrong, but hell, we both thought that the other one didn't give a fuck so we both didn't say anything. Now, light was terrible and my friend only took couple shitty photos that shows nothing. Well, he took the two that can give you look into what weird shit we walked in. Anyway, first room was normal. Nothing there, just some rubbish lying. And then we walked into second, larger room. This is when it became weird as fuck. There was none of this shit on the first floor. And now the whole fucking floor was covered in styrofoam with these strange symbols on it. The whole fucking walls covered by those symbols. Yeah, it may not sound scary at all, but being there combined with that weird feeling has fucking done it. There was something really wrong with this place and we knew it. I mean, who the hell covers whole room with such shit? But we decided to keep on. This is also where the friend's phone died. I didn't, t even bring one with me since I lived near and I didn't really had the need. Only thing we had was a cheap lighter. Anyway, those fucking drawings. There were also in the other room. More symbols and those weird fucking fetus-like things. Shit was unsettling at least. And the thing is. I only realized it then that it almost felt as someone was watching me. Which was absurd since there was no way to look into that building just like that. We roamed the second floor like that, looking at those weird symbols and fetuses. Nothing much really except those, we decided to slowly come back. And this is when we heard something. Like slight screech. And this is when wind putted out our lighter. 
In split seconds we both figured that there was no fucking wind in this building earlier, not a slightest draft. Maybe we were both just paranoid but we simultaneously noped as fuck. I don't really remember, I think I saw some movement the moment we escaped though that hole to the first floor, but that was probably nerves and all. It was dark, the atmosphere was weirding us out and we lost our reason once we decided to get out of there anyway. Although this place can't leave my mind. I don't think it's the only one like that. I think I will prepare and I will check out the other factories. Maybe I will go back to this one. Maybe during a day. For sure I'm not coming there alone. Me. Used to be scrawny lil faggot. Bad diet, bad sleep, bad attitude etc. Have sleep paralysis all the time. Always would be fucking giga scary demons, ghosties, etc. Always scared shitless just hoping it stops. Get actual sensation from them touching me. Ice fucking cold. Wanna cry, scream, and run away. But I can't fucking move. FFW years later. Get slash fit slash AF. Eat healthy, good attitude, strong AF. Big BOI coming through. Haven't had sleep paralysis in years. Finally have it for the first time a few nights ago. I awake and find that I can't move. Fucking annoying fuck. Annoyed as fuck. Looking around. Then I see it. In the dark half of my room an even darker thing. Size of a small boy black as space. Still can't fucking move. It starts slow walking over to me. I'm angry. Not like caught my wife cheating angry. Like star shattering ass fuck angry. Start shaking out of anger that this faggot has the gall to challenge me at my most vulnerable. Start literally fucking growling because I can't roar at this little ghost faggot. At the peak of my anger feel like I'm going to explode. Almost like it senses what will happen. It starts slowly moving backwards. Disappears into the wall. Soon as it's gone paralysis goes away. I leap out of bed naked. So fucking goddamn aneurysm mad. Rush over to wall. Smack fuck out of it. Start roar laughing. Lil fucking bitch ass ghost. My natural instinct used to be one rooted, based in fear. Now it is one forged of fire and anger. B16. Be living in backwoods of South Carolina. Hear stories from local kids of creepy stuff happening in forest about 2 miles from my new house. Decide to check it out, can't be that scary, right? Grab pistol, knife, and flashlight and head out into dense forest. Starts getting dark, turn on flashlight. Heavy fog all of a sudden rolls in. Bringing a smell of copper, and burned hair. Hairs on back of neck start to stand on end. Start hearing whispers and giggles. Hear something running around in woods near me. Hear it get louder. No. Closer. Turn around to see something crawling extremely fast low to the ground on four legs. But seemed to have arms and legs like human. Fire a shot right into its back. And can see blood splatter and gunshot wound. Let's out a blood curdling screech and retreats into woods. Fog lips and smell suddenly goes away. Nope. Betamax all the way home. Get home and there it is. Right in my driveway. Runs towards me, and I shoot at it, but the bullet doesn't fire. I'm guessing it was a dud. It jumps up and all I can see is its huge white eyes. Blackout. And wake up on top of dad's car with dad over me trying to wake me up. My head hurts like a bitch and my ears are ringing. Tell dad about what happened in woods and he just laughs. And tells me it was nothing. All goes normal for about another 3 hours when. Dad says hey Jake. Mind getting me those steaks out of the fridge. I just look at him and say. Dad, my name is Anon. Not Jake. Just looks at me like he is full of hatred directed towards me. Give him steaks and he just goes into his room with them. Uncooked. Comes out an hour later with the package and throws it away. 
I don't even think about asking. At 11 pm he tells me to go to bed, which is odd, because it is a Friday, and he doesn't usually care when I stay up. But I do as told and go into my room. At around 3.15 my door opens. It's my dad. I say nothing and pretend to be asleep. That smell of copper returns to the air, and I feel sick to my stomach. My dad sits on the edge of my bed and just looks at me for what I would say to be about 30 minutes. He then mumbles something under his breath, and a voice I didn't recognize. My blood turned cold and I just lay there. When he got up and left my heart dropped and I just lay there until morning. The next morning I wake up and my dad is asleep on his lazy boy recliner, and his nose is bleeding, I wake him up and I'm still spooked I ask him about the blood, and he has no idea where it came from. I ask him about the night before and he has no idea what I'm talking about, and he doesn't remember waking me up either. My heart drops. When he states that it was still Friday, when I know for a fact that it is Saturday. But he argues with me until I show him my phone with the date. At this point we are both freaked. I've never ventured out into the woods since then. And nothing strange has happened since then. Except sometimes I will hear the front door open and shut a few times during the night.